Zaki had arranged to meet Ashwin at one of his favorite Durban haunts. An avid reader and researcher, Ashwin has, both in his own right and in collaboration with fellow academic Professor Gulam Vahid, authored a number of books chronicling the early Indian experience in South Africa. Their latest work has a particular focus on the story of indenture. Hello, Ashwin! Great to see you. It's so good to see you. I can't wait to chat today. How did this mammoth task of writing this book come about? Well, it's a story that had to be told. And one of the challenges for historians is to take stuff out of the archives and bring it alive to a reading audience. And once we got into the archives, looked at the letters, looked at the court records, we understood that indenture was an epic African journey that continues into the present. It must have been quite a journey of discovery. Every day in the archives, a new revelation, a new inspiration. And I felt like a child. I just wanted to be back in the archives, looking at more files, telling more stories. Ashwin, for you, what are the most memorable stories? The one of people who never made it. They came across in the ship, but because of the situation on the ship and the circumstances in which they found themselves, many died of malnutrition and some were imprisoned on the ship. And one of them was a woman called Munyama. And she was chained, she had messed herself, she wasn't allowed out of a cell. And eventually, one of the indentured just heard a sound in the water. And either she had escaped and committed suicide because of the humiliation and the oppression, or she was pushed overboard by the captain or one of the sailors on the ship. She'll just be a footnote in history. What we do in our research is try and retrace her story by going through the court records of the case that was held in Durban. And of course, once the case was held, nobody was found responsible for the death of Munyama. And she stands in for so many of the unknown indentured. What were the conditions like on the ships? It was a kind of prison where the indentured were given a meager diet and any infraction that the captain felt, he would deal with it incredibly harshly. On the other hand, the ship became a place in which the indentured started to build a new community. In many cases, the indentured called the ships the Temple of Jagannath. Because remember that there were different castes, people from different villages. And sometimes a Brahmin said, I won't eat from a hand of an untouchable. And people said, well, you have to eat because here there's no caste. We're all in the same situation. We're all indentured, we have a number. And if we don't unite together, we will die. And what were they promised or what did they expect? The promise was a labor contract. When they arrived, that labor contract was meaningless. How has going through this journey affected you? Well, on a personal level, it's changed my life. I thought I knew the story, but in reading back into the archives, one starts to think about many things. One needs to think about the position of women in society. Today, people are talking about the oppression of women, the women's places in the home and so on. And I want to go back and tell them, well, there were women who came alone here and built lives and they had that kind of strength. There are people who are still talking about caste, but they couldn't be caste amongst the indentured because for every five men, you had have one woman. And if you didn't marry that woman, you'd never marry in your life. There were, there were gay relationships amongst men, and yet today the community wants to deny those kinds of things. So for me, history is not only about the past, it's how you read it into the present circumstance. And therefore, the story of indenture is a real living story because it instructs us, it, it makes us rethink all the prejudices we have in the present. And so when people even talk about racism and people being inferior or, or, or superior and so on, go back to the story of indenture and see how people were treated there and think whether you want to be part of a system that treats people in similar ways. I can't believe that my history is actually between these two covers. Well, let's go and <laughs> uncover it. <laughs> you have a chapter called When the Coolies Made Christmas. What is that about? Well, that's, that's an incredibly interesting story. The only time they were allowed off plantations or the railways was to celebrate Muharram. And the whites call it Kuli Christmas, and it was three days. And no matter what religion you were, you came into the center of the city, you had tazias, you had floats, and people almost divided up into gangs where they competed with each other. And it was the only time indentured met other indentured. What about religious and cultural expressions? This was one of the most powerful things of indenture. When we wanted to understand how the indentured survived in an atmosphere of semi-slavery, they built 
small temples, mosques, churches. And these not only became places where people went to pray, but they became community centers. And out of these temples were small schools. And out of schools, the indenture demanded that the children learn English, because many already knew they were never going back to India. And if they were going to make it in the white man's economy, then their children had to have an education to be able to read and write. Ashwin, what are some of the most important missing links of our history that should be filled? There's so much to be written about the Indian community. To the ordinary teachers and doctors and lawyers who did so much to weld this community as a defensive mode, not to be rolled over, but also as an offensive mode to confront the strictures of apartheid. Ashwin, thank you so much for sharing these big stories with me. Oh, thanks for the big <laughs> hug. <laughs> there are so many details missing from our amazing history and I'm so lucky to have stolen some time with Ashwin to shed some light on them.